Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, among the international criminal law community, the Asia Pacific is often referred to as the region with the least number of ratifying International Criminal Court or ICC states. And often the discussion focuses on how to enhance awareness or involvement of the region. However, the region has had a long relationship with ICL or Justice for Mass Atrocities, one that reaches back to the hundreds of post-World War II trials conducted across the region. The region has also served as a setting for various ICL efforts and mechanisms, ranging for internationalized courts in Timor-Leste, Cambodia, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions and Fact-Finding Commissions. Civil society activists and lawyers working in the region are increasingly drawing on and remaking ICL norms and arrangements. So we are particularly fortunate today to welcome two trailblazers in the international criminal law field, Dato Shamala Alahendra and Dr. Priya Pillai. Shamala is a Malaysian lawyer with over 24 years of experience. She's presently the Sexual and Gender-Based Crimes Advisor to the OHCHR Sri Lanka Accountability Project and has held a variety of leadership and legal positions in different ICL mechanisms including the Independent Investigative Mechanism for Myanmar, the Special Panel for Serious Crimes in Timor-Leste, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the International Criminal Court at The Hague. She's also the focal point for Asia for the ICC Bar Association. Our second, our second speaker, we are very lucky to have with us Dr. Priya Pillai, who has worked in a variety of national and international institutions, including the ICTY and the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies headquarters in Geneva. She currently heads the Asia Justice Coalition Secretariat, which focuses on justice and accountability in Asia. She has also published extensively on ICL topics and does much to enhance awareness of ICL in the region. So our speakers will be speaking for about 15 minutes about the ICL challenges that they have encountered in their work, as well as a little bit about the career opportunities. And then we have plenty of time for Q&A from the audience to maximize interaction with our speakers. So without further ado, I'll now hand it over to uh, Dr. Ala, uh, Dato Alahendra. Shamala, please. Really, thank you so much and good morning to everyone. I'm delighted to be here today and to be speaking to you alongside Dr. Priya and also Dr. Weiling on the application or relevance, shall I say, of international criminal law in this region. In my 15 minutes or so, I will not be going into the substantive law and my perspectives will be a very personal one based on over two decades of being a practitioner in this field of law and a little bit of history and an appeal of some sort. The views and observations that I will express are entirely my own and do not in any way represent the position of any of the courts or teams I have and am working on. I'm going to start by saying The Hague is many miles away from Singapore. It's about 10,530 kilometers away. In fact, as the crow or the Singapore Airlines flies. So it's a long way from us. Yet the topic we are having a conversation about today can make it seem even further away. It is a different continent with different cuisine, very different climate, a different culture. The Hague is known as the home of international law. It is the home of the International Court of Justice, of the ICTY, the Special Court for Sierra Leone trial of former president of Liberia, Charles Taylor, which I prosecuted, was conducted in The Hague. And the world's first permanent international criminal court, the ICC, chose The Hague as its headquarters. Other courts, such as the Special Tribunal for Lebanon and the Kosovo Specialist Chambers, the Iran Claims Tribunals, are all based in The Hague. The trial of uh, Kabuga relating to the genocide of Rwanda in 1994 is also being conducted in The Hague. Now, despite this initial overview, the message that I really want to emphasize today is that international criminal law is 
close to us here in Asia. We are a part of it, and we have a very proud role in carving out, building, and applying international criminal law in very real ways, and we should own it. As His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of Singapore, told the General Assembly very recently, for small states like Singapore, the principles of the UN Charter and international law are not matters of academic debate. They are matters of life and death. A system based on the idea that might is right is simply unacceptable. His eloquent remarks acutely articulates what is at stake when it comes to international law and international criminal law. And we, as individual countries, a region and a continent, we must jointly own and fully participate in this body of law. My personal caution is that we ignore it at our peril. The ICC prosecutor Karim Khan Casey has also reminded us that the Rome Statute, which established the ICC almost 25 years ago, is not owned by Italy. The Geneva Conventions protecting civilians or directing minimum conduct when dealing with prisoners of war doesn't simply represent the laws of Switzerland. And the Hague Convention isn't the property of the Netherlands. Rather, international law is part of the common heritage of humanity, and it is owned equally by those in the global south as much as the global north, and it reflects and must be seen to reflect all legal systems, religion, and cultures. This is not polemics. Please allow me to say that. If international criminal law is not seen to be equally owned, it will not be equally applied or applied at all. And in any event, there is no doubt that international criminal law has been heavily shaped by the Asian influence throughout the decades. I don't need to go back to the cylinder of Cyrus the Great, or before that, the Code of Hammurabi, or to Islamic law. If one simply focuses on more modern times and observes what happened in the aftermath of the Second World War, one sees international criminal law in action right here in Asia. You will all be aware of the trial of major Nazi war criminals, which took place in Nuremberg. But the tribunal in the Far East, the so-called Tokyo trials, were an important landmark, emphasizing that all lives matter equally, and that conduct which was viewed as not acceptable in Europe is not acceptable in Asia either. The jurisprudence from the Tokyo trials have many landmarks, and of course Asia itself was blighted with awful suffering. We have the phenomenon of the comfort women, we have the rape of Nanking, and the destruction in all of that, we saw the application of international criminal law here. Now, I am the first to recognize that the law was not perfectly applied, and those trials at Nuremberg and also in Tokyo will also continue to be judged by those it did not even try to prosecute. But the role of the Tokyo trials, the fact that there was participation of Asian judges in international criminal justice is something that should be underlined and applauded. And that kind of participation of Asia has in fact deepened. We have had very close to us, next door, the extraordinary chambers in the court of Cambodia. And there we have Cambodian and international prosecutors, judges, lawyers, working side by side, trying terrible crimes from Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge regime in the 1970s and the awful atrocities of the killing fields that many of you would have seen in movies. And one goes to Phnom Penh. And you go either to the documentation center or to Tol Seng, the S21 prison, as it is known. You will see where people were kept, where they were confined, and where, in the words of Comrade Doik, people were crushed. You see the application of the law was the very least that we owed those victims. Duke was, Doik was convicted and sentenced for those awful crimes in Asia with the participation of judges and lawyers from Cambodia and the region, including lawyers from Singapore. Also close to us across the water was the special panel for serious crimes in East Timor, 
where I served as a prosecutor for several years, and I also had the privilege of working with Dr. Wheeling for a short period. Even before the ICC opened its doors, the applicable laws in the cases we prosecuted in Timor were drawn from the Rome Statute, which were replicated in the Untied regulations. And like Cambodia, we worked alongside Timorese prosecutors, judges, and defense lawyers who were equal partners in the pursuit of accountability for some of the most heinous crimes committed against Timorese men, women, and children. I have vivid memories of witnessing exhumations of mass graves and hearing the mourns of family and villages of their kin whose remains who were in those graves I was standing over as victims of brutal mass killings. I recall leading the testimonies of Timorese women who had been detained and raped and abused by Timorese militiamen and Indonesian soldiers. I recall speaking to survivors from the Suai Church massacre, recounting the brutal attack on 6 September 1999 by Indonesian soldiers and Timorese militia acting jointly. Now, at no point do I recall ever telling myself, this is somebody else's misery, or this is westernized justice that I am applying. I felt a responsibility and a duty, not only by dint of my job description and UN appointment, but because I am from this soil, from this region, and I felt compelled to use whatever little learning I have to serve my region. And for all of you who have this opportunity to study international law, I never studied international law. My service to the UN and international criminal justice in Timor were some of the most precious and worthwhile experiences I have. But I have felt a similar sense of affinity in training Filipino judges in Tagate at Filja in ICL, or conducting training for the Human Rights Commission of Indonesia. I felt the same commitment and the same affinity and sense of justice and connection to the rule of law when I was prosecuting military and rebel commanders for crimes committed during the 11 year civil war in Sierra Leone. And when I was part of the prosecution team building cases against President Omar al-Bashir of Sudan. I never felt this is not my business. It's not affecting me. Going back to The Hague, when the Yugoslav tribunal was formed, the very first trial had an Asian, in fact, a Malaysian judge, Justice Lal Chan Bora. Judge Bora also sat in the appeals in the Akayesu case, which brought about a major shift in accountability for sexual violence and international criminal justice. The Akayesu case saw the very first ever conviction for genocide, and it was the first time that rape and other forms of sexual violence was held to constitute genocide. And we must be proud we had an Asian who took part in those deliberations. Before the establishment of the ICC, Indonesia adopted law number 26 of 2000 of the Human Rights Court, which implemented Rome Statute crimes under domestic laws. And this law also empowered the National Human Rights Commission to conduct preliminary investigations into alleged cases of crimes against humanity and genocide, and to make recommendations for prosecution to the AG's office. And we are now eagerly looking forward and looking towards the Constitutional Court of Indonesia, which is right now seized of an application for the amendment of the constitution so that the Myanmar military can be tried for crimes against humanity, war crimes, or genocide of the Rohingya community in Indonesia. The biggest financial contributor to the ICC is Japan, and only then Germany and France and the UK. And we're all witnessing the Ukraine conflict going on. Japan is one of those states that preferred the Ukraine situation to the ICC prosecutor from very far away. I also learned about the important role that women from the global South played in shaping international norms that affect us. For example, the role Hansa Mehta from India played in the 1940s in changing the language in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from all men are born free and equal to all human beings 
are born free and equal in Article 1 of the Declaration. And I also learned that the first draft of the CEDAW, the International Bill of Rights for Women, the first draft was drafted by Leticia Ramos Shahani of the Philippines. I want us to pause and remember that as we sit here discussing the relevance of ICL to this region, grave crimes are continuing to take place at a phenomenal scale in Myanmar. Children continue to be delib deliberately targeted for attacks by the Myanmar military. You are reading the news, I'm sure, of reports of children and women being detained and tortured and schools and civilian objects being targeted, deliberately targeted in military airstrikes. There is no perfect model of international criminal justice. And I am of the view that the ICC must not be viewed as the panacea of all ills. It is not. By their very nature, these international courts and the ICC are actually very limited in their reach, most often prosecuting only senior level perpetrators. We will, and we have been, disappointing scores of victims. That's the reality of international criminal justice. Whilst UN and other reports would have recorded thousands of killings and rapes and recruitment of children, the judgments of the international courts will only detail a handful of those crimes, representative of what is taking place. Hardly even scratches the surface to give you an insight as to the scale of what is taking place. That is the reality. These courts were never meant to try every single perpetrator or to prosecute every single crime that was committed during a conflict. And this is also why domestic courts have to take more of the strain and why universal jurisdiction is so important. Without signing up to the Rome Statute, states in Asia, especially within ASEAN, we can play a role in ensuring there is no impunity for international crimes. For one, we can support the work of the International, the Independent Investigative Mechanism for Myanmar, for example, IIIM, as the head of the IIIM, Nicholas Kumjan reiterated recently, its work is consistent with the very first point of the ASEAN's five-point consensus, which is the immediate cessation of violence. The work of the mechanism by collecting evidence of the very worst international crimes actually complements these efforts to end the violence. Successive Malaysian prime ministers have described the crimes against the Rohingya by the Myanmar military as genocide and Malaysia supported the creation of this mechanism. We must be commended for this. When you're thinking of a career in international criminal law, your options are not limited simply because Singapore or Malaysia is not a state party to the Rome Statute. Neither is Malaysia. And I served as a prosecution trial attorney and as defense counsel in several major cases at the ICC. There are other courts you can serve in other processes you can serve in, commissions of inquiry and fact-finding missions under the authority of the OHCHR, and independent investigative mechanisms and teams are an option. I would urge you to consider working on defense teams and representing accused persons. Fair trial rights is a human right, and representing victims as well. The law is not so different, and you can practice it without too much difficulty. I did, without studying it. If you feel this body of law belongs to you, because it does, you will become more active and play your part in helping to confront these crimes. We need nothing less than really a call for action. And all of you listening to us today should consider yourselves as excellent potential recruits. When considering international justice, my suggestion is we do not get distracted by the first word international, but rather, we must focus on the second, which is justice. It is whether there is justice that leaves a legacy, not whether it is international or not. When speaking about the need for justice and accountability for past, for past crimes in Sri Lanka, 
the former UN Under Secretary General for Genocide, Adam Adyeng, he reminded us that justice is not retribution. It is not an act of revenge. It is not about putting one community above another. Justice should work for the benefit of all. It should be in the interest of all the society to pursue the truth, to support victims from all communities, repair and the harm they suffered, and to embark on institutional reform. These are the pillars of justice. It's not just one. And let me conclude by suggesting that there should be no safe haven for the type of terrible cruelty that manifests itself in international crimes and that, that we are called to confront and redress as the international community, which Asia is part of. This requires concerted action and a determination to no longer tolerate in any way these crimes as legitimate in the 21st century. We need action, not words. And we need to believe that we each have a responsibility and that we can collectively make a difference. I was reading an article in The Guardian over the weekend, you know, in which I read a warning from Eli Rosenbaum to perpetrators or would-be perpetrators that if you act on criminal orders or you issue criminal orders, you should not think about being a tourist in most of Europe because you may get arrested and prosecuted or extradited. We should similarly ensure that Malaysia or Singapore or any country in our region are also not tourist destinations for such visitors or a safe haven for impunity. This really is, is my appeal and I will leave it at here. Thank you so much for, for listening to me. Thank you very much, Amala, for that um, very important call to action. Uh, I'll now, um, without further ado, pass this to uh, Priya. Yeah. Thank you, Wiling, and thank you for the invitation um, you know, to, to be with you this morning. After Shamala's really eloquent and really inspirational um, you know, talk, that's a very hard act to follow, but I will do my best. Um, I think, you know, I, I think sort of touching on some of the uh, some of the points that have been raised uh, this morning, I think what I would like to do is a re-emphasize what our previous speaker has just said, which is, you know, this is a region that needs to sort of take ownership as well. And we've been doing a lot of this work for a long time. There are many of us who've been involved for many years and you know, so it's not an alien area of law. It's not an area of law that is completely sort of unknown or unknowable. And I think that's sort of a, a, an important thing to remember because as Shamala said, you know, the minute you say international criminal law, the immediate reaction of a lot of people in the region is, but that doesn't apply. I mean, that's not something Asia does. And, you know, I've, I've had that reaction from, from many, many individuals, some law students, um, you know, academics, practitioners as well. And I think part of this discussion is also to raise awareness of how engaged we have been and how engaged we need to continue to be in different ways. In terms of thinking of ICL, I would really term it as the ICL ecosystem. So we're not just talking about international criminal law as litigated in international courts, but we're talking about hybrid tribunals, we are also talking about domestic law and domestic courts that might apply international legal principles. You know, Shamala had mentioned the Indonesian um, law. If you look at the Philippines as well, the Philippines actually incorporated and took on elements of the Rome Statute before they signed on to the Rome Statute. So you've got a lot of states in the region that are looking at ICL through the domestic lens as well, perhaps not enough, but that is something that you know, is happening. Um, I think in terms of this ICL ecosystem, the way that I see it is, it's not just about ratification of the Rome Statute. Yes, that is important. That is something that we need to continue pushing for, whether as academics, 
civil society, practitioners, because that's sort of an easy hook in a way, in terms of legislation, in terms of moving the law forward domestically. Um, as we know, Asia Pacific has 19 state parties, which is one of the lower regions, um, you know, in terms of signing up to the Rome Statute. But don't forget, currently at the ICC, we have open investigations on Afghanistan, we've got Myanmar, Bangladesh, we've got the Philippines. So this region is actually quite represented in what the court is doing as well. So, you know, let's keep that in mind. Um, we've had withdrawals and near misses with the Rome Statute. And I would also emphasize, you know, when we are talking about the Asian region, we're talking about a, a, a region that is very diverse, culturally, geographically, linguistically, but we're also talking about one third of humanity. If you're looking at just the numbers, you know, India and China, we've got a large part of the world's population in these areas. And, you know, we do want to make sure that we are talking about accountability and we're talking about addressing impunity seriously, you know, in, in, in the ways that we engage with international criminal law, as well as the ways that we engage with domestic law whether that's incorporating criminal law, whether that's human rights law as well. I think the one elephant in the room, of course, always is, especially when you look at Asia, somehow the discussions around sovereignty and Asian values. And I think that really needs to be debunked in terms of the approach by states, in terms of you know, what people want. It's not about non-interference in internal affairs, it's really, you need to switch the, the discussion to accountability and not having impunity in the region. And I think if you flip the discussion, that's where you know, we can actually make progress and actually effect change in this area of law. So I think just this idea of an ICL ecosystem is critical and I think it's more encompassing and it covers a range of areas and aspects, including you know, specific types of work that you can do, which would include you know, advocacy, being part of civil society, academia, practitioners. And I think these all form a cohesive whole. One can't do without the other. And I think it's sort of a reinforcing um, uh, effect. And which is why I think discussions like this are so critical and so important, that we're all in the room together, that we all exchange ideas, and that we've got these different sort of perspectives on what the international criminal law ecosystem is, but all geared towards the same sort of end goal, which is accountability and ensuring no impunity. So I think, you know, let's keep that in mind as we journey through some of the, some of the sort of more specific details and sort of the more technical aspects of the law, but this should be sort of the, the screensaver background for you in terms of the back of your mind as we sort of move forward and, and discuss some of these issues. I will say, you know, picking up on, on of course, the, the ICC, since it is, it is a, a big part of this discussion, the one thing that I will say is when we're looking at ICC investigations in Asia Pacific, don't forget Myanmar, Bangladesh was actually a groundbreaking um, investigation. Here you have a state party and a non-state party. So for all, you know, all the discussion around signature and ratification, you actually do have a way of asserting jurisdiction. And I have to say that the prosecutor was very innovative and basically said, look, you've got international crimes that are occurring that have cross-border implications. And this is something that needs to be investigated. And as you know, you know, the pretrial chamber one decision of 6th September, 2018, basically gave the go ahead there was a request to open an investigation in July 2019. The authorization was given on the 14th of November 2019. I think just anecdotally, that week was a really momentous week because in that week of November 2019, you had the application at the International Court of Justice linked to the Genocide Convention by the Gambia against Myanmar. You had the authorization to open the investigation and you also had the public sort of knowledge of the filing of the universal jurisdiction case by colleagues, uh, the Burmese Rohingya organization UK in Argentina in that same week. So really a very momentous week in 2019 where you had all these legal developments 
and all geared towards accountability. Sort of using that as a spring point, I do want to talk a bit about universal jurisdiction in a bit more detail, because I do see this as sort of a new frontier. We're talking about the ICL ecosystem. You know, we've got international courts, we've got hybrid tribunals. All of these are very expensive. Some of them uh, suffer from really a huge time lag in establishing and setting them up due to sort of global politics, due to budgetary considerations, due to sort of, uh, you know, General Assembly or Security Council uh, resolutions and discussions. So an international or internationalized court is not a given. It's something that, you know, in particular instances, when the timing is right, when the discussions take on a, a particular momentum, that they do get established. Now you've got a permanent world court, you've got the ICC. Of course, there are, there are discussions and issues around state parties, jurisdictions as well. So it's important to look at home. It's important to look domestically and locally as well, using those international principles. And I think to Shamila's point as well, you know, it's sort of bringing the global to the local and vice versa. It's sort of looking at the problem in two ways. And I think both of us have always sort of used our experiences internationally to focus back at home as well in the region and vice versa. I mean, I think there's a huge sort of uh, uh, give and take, and there's a lot of cross pollination that happens, which I see as incredibly important. You know, it's we need to have an eye on the world. We need to know what's going on, but we also need to be able to apply some of those principles in our region and sort of, you know, really work towards um, ensuring that some of the principles that, you know, Asian states have also supported and worked on decades ago are implemented more effectively in the region. And one of the ways that we're looking at uh, quite seriously now is universal jurisdiction. And, you know, understanding that an internationalized um, tribunal or court is not the perfect solution in all cases. It might be, it might not be. So let's look at other options as well. And, you know, I think the way I approach it is that it really is, there are different parts of the puzzle. Really look at it as a big jigsaw puzzle within the ICL ecosystem. And what are those pressure points and what are the areas that we need to look at in more detail? And, you know, I'll, I'll just give you another anecdotal um, story. When Brooke uh, Tunkin sort of, you know, went down this path of the universal jurisdiction case, we started, we were having some discussions with, with a range of, of individuals about universal jurisdiction. And there's an, an NGO, a civil society organization called Trial, which comes out with its universal jurisdiction annual review. It's annual every year, they map UJ cases around the world. And uh, I was speaking on a panel at Leiden University a few months ago, and I, I was going through the report and I decided to put together a map of all the UJ cases. And it's quite striking. When you look at that map, it's clustered around Europe. So, you know, for me, the question was, where's the universality in some of this? You know, is it really a global north phenomenon? And linked to that, I also started asking questions saying, it's fantastic, we've got these cases that are going, you know, ongoing in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Switzerland, linked to Syria mainly. But keeping the hat on in terms of my, my focus on Myanmar, is there something we can do in the region? Are there jurisdictions within the region that we can look at for some of these prosecutions, for some of these cases? And the immediate sort of pushback I got from a lot of people was, Asia, it's not possible. And you know, for me, the question was, why? Have we done in-depth research? Do we, you know, we've got the, the chambers of Cambodia, we've got East Timor, we've got all these examples. So why is this not possible? And I realized that there actually hadn't been an in-depth analysis of jurisdictions to look at the legal factors, to look at the ecosystem, to really take a nuanced view of whether there are particular ways that universal jurisdiction cases may be initiated. You know, I always recall the, the uh, example in the US of the Torture Victims Protection Act. 
very few people knew about this one clause within the TPPA, which was then used to initiate uh, proceedings, legal proceedings on, the beh on behalf of torture victims. So a serious assessment of what are the options in the region and what is the legal ecosystem in the region is something that I found to be completely lacking. And so, you know, and, and I understand from your professor that you all have been asked to look at a convening note on universal jurisdiction, which is one of four. So the Asia Justice Coalition, what we're doing is we're taking this very seriously and we're doing it in a very nuanced sort of um, not a knee-jerk manner. So we've done four um, in-depth discussions with experts across the board, which include a cross-section, practitioners, academics, and we've looked at different aspects of what it takes to really look at universal jurisdiction seriously within the region. So we've looked, we've had sort of, and these were workshops that we held over three days online for each convening. So we looked at the role of civil society. We looked at the global South more generally. We also looked specifically at Asia. And I know that you all have, have looked at that convening note. So I think just to say that there is need for this work and that we are looking at it as one more sort of piece of the puzzle within this jigsaw of the ICL ecosystem. Of course, you know, there are, there are, we need to be critical as well. We need to think through some of the strategies that we might use when initiating a UJ case. Is, is the legal environment appropriate? Is the political environment appropriate? Are we actually going to get results that we want or is it going to set us back? You know, these are all strategic things that you need to think through when you're um, thinking of the options for accountability that are on the table. And I think there is uh, another elephant in the room that we do need to address, which is this assessment of, you know, when, I, when you look at that map, that universal jurisdiction is global north, that it is, uh, you know, when you look at prosecute versus extradite, that it's sort of seen as one way traffic that you might have perpetrators on territory of, of particular jurisdictions that are then extradited to the global north and then prosecuted. Um, there are questions around the proximity to affected communities. And I think that is incredibly important and we need to keep that in mind. There are sensitivities around sort of external intervention and neocolonialism. And that's you know, an argument that has been brought up also linked to the ICC. So, you know, we, we do need to address these and we need to also push back. And the way we can do that is ownership, is actually taking um, steps that we will look at the region seriously. We will actually address, um, you know, address impunity and we will look at accountability in a very serious manner. I think just in terms of barriers to universal jurisdiction, and some of these might be applicable, you know, to ICL more broadly as well, is you know a, a legal infrastructure. So we need a conducive legal infrastructure for universal jurisdiction. Uh, we need an uptake in domestic laws. But the other way that you can also look at universal jurisdiction is, you know, and I'll give you the example of of Al Capone, who was basically prosecuted for tax fraud. And while I'm not saying that's ideal, what I am saying is that there are maybe, we do need to look at alternate legal hooks. So we've got issues that, you know, many states around the table are concerned about. Trafficking, organized crime, you've got actually discussions on piracy as well. So are those issues that we can pick up and look at universal jurisdiction linked to some of these other issues? Again, this is a work in progress. This is something we're thinking through. But, you know, I think then there needs to be a certain amount of ingenuity and, and, um, and, and discussion of thinking out of the box a little bit as well. In terms of the political environment, of course, we've got, you know, to tackle the, the discussion around sovereignty and that it's imposed justice. And I think that's, that's important. And perhaps universal jurisdiction, you know, initiating cases in the region is one way of tackling that narrative and pushing back on that narrative. In terms of the, you know, the one, one uh, case that I would like to actually highlight also is Myanmar, Argentina, uh, the UJ case, because I think that gives us clues. It is, you know, also global south. Yes, it's not in the region, but perhaps there might be clues in that example for us in how we might approach it within the region. 
So I think when you look at Argentina, there are legal enablers. So there's a civil legal system, which has a role for civil parties as well. The constitution, Article 118, talks about jurisdiction over violation of international law outside national borders. There's a Rome Statute implementation law, which permits jurisdiction over foreigners committing crimes um, in treaties signed by Argentina abroad. Now, those are some of the legal technical factors, but there are other factors also at play. One, you've had other UJ prosecutions in Argentina because of their experience of dictatorship, because of their experience of a lot of these transitional justice mechanisms. You have had Franco era, you know, Spain, uh, we've had cases linked to Spain and Franco in Argentina. So there's been that experience of prosecutors and, and judges who understand what sort of it takes for a universal jurisdiction case. Legal representation. So the former UN Special Rapporteur for Myanmar from 2008 to 2014, Thomas Quintana, is a lawyer in Argentina. So he has in-depth knowledge of not just the Myanmar context, but also the Argentinian context. Um, you've got civil society. So you, know, you had an organization, uh, a leader in this organization who, who had these links and who sort of was uh, willing to take that leap as well with, um, with the uh, former UN Special Rap uh, Rapporteur to initiate this case. And, and of course, now let's not forget that the IIIM, the mechanism for Myanmar, is also talking about the emphasis on universal jurisdiction. So you've got this within the UJ ecosystem, you've got another set of ecosystem, and you've got another set of, of factors that play into why it might be successful or why it might be initiated. And I think just in terms of, you know, I'll, I'll end uh, with just a few points on UJ again you need certain things for the magic to happen in a way. And sometimes it's a matter of, of chance and sort of the stars being aligned, but most cases it's not. It's really a case of a lot of people undertaking the hard work. So doing the legal research, legal practitioners, you know, initiating the cases, um, ensuring that you, you're strategic about it. And there are very, very sort of concrete um, issues as well. You know, you've got questions around famil familiarity with international crimes, access to evidence, presence of the alleged perpetrator or victim, political legislative will, incorporation of law, international law into domestic law, um, you know, the investigative capacity for these cases, and a way to safeguard and ensure that victims' rights are protected. So I think I'll stop on this note, just to emphasize that there are, you know, many ways to ensure accountability, and this region has experience and has the, the, the talent and the capability. And I would really urge all of you, you know, to ensure that if you're interested in this area, that, that you look at some of these issues and you know, ensure that you, you factor them into your practice um, going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Priya. And thank you, Sushamala, for your first presentation.